Welcome to our session. I do hope that you are able to go through topic one. And um, in case of any queries uh, during our live classes, be free to ask, be free to inquire of what you've not understood. So in this topic, we shall focus on the risk factors um, of the non communicable body diseases, the NCDs. And basically, with these ones, what we focus on we are looking at those probable reasons as to why an, an NCD occurs, like what is likely to bring about a certain type of disease. So basically with this chapter as an introduction, this chapter or this topic equips you as a learner um, with knowledge on risk factors that usually lead to people getting non-communicable diseases. And these risk factors are not reduced, are not reduced the chances of getting the NCDs high. So the basic thing is that uh, we have factors that are likely to propagate the onset of NCDs and, and uh, their progression and even making the condition bad. Uh, the objectives of this lesson today is that I don't think you should be able to explain the risk factors of tobacco explain the risk the risks of inadequate the risks of inadequate uh, physical activities also by the end of this lesson you will be able to explain <coughs> or describe the risks of a healthy diet um, and with this we also focus on avoid and ability we we'll also be able to discuss the risks of harmful use of alcohol. We'll be able to explain and evaluate other modifiable risk factors and also explain some of the strategies that can be used to control or prevent the risk factors. So we shall have some other learning activities through this course. So ensure that you participate in the discussion. You do the study of this information so that uh, at the end of the day, you are acquainted with relevant knowledge in line with this. Now, we find that we have it that the NCDs share a risk uh, share risk factors, some of which are modifiable and others non-modifiable. By saying modifiable, it means they can be changed, they can be manipulated, but the non-modifiable ones, they can never be manipulated as in it's difficult to change their course. It's difficult to make changes to to, to, to these um, certain aspects that bring about disease. Some of the modifiable factors usually include one, tobacco, two, we have a healthy diet, we have physical inactivity, we also have the use of alcohol. So basically, maybe we begin with tobacco, and uh, these are the, we are going to focus first on the modifiable risk factor. And as we begin with tobacco use, we find that tobacco is the leading preventable cause of premature death globally. So usually with tobacco, it brings about preventable deaths globally. And um, it's important to note that it's leading. You see, like in Kenya, <laughs> we've had so many people taking tobacco, that is cigarette smoking. And um, until there came that um, government initiative, whereby we have smokers zones. And with these smoking zones, we have people going there maybe at specific times, or rather not just um, taking their, their, their cigars from any place. Because remember, if I take a cigar, that, that, that um, moshi, you in Yenatoka kwa your cigarette, if you inhale it, you are able to also be like someone who has been inhaling the tobacco or who's been using the tobacco. So it gives risk to many other people who are using it. Directly important uh, know that it's estimated that it costs tobacco use or tobacco uh, causes uh, approximately five million deaths annually, and this may rise to about ten million by the year 2030, with 70 percent of the deaths occurring in developing countries if no proper public health initiatives are put in place. So that means that by learning this course, it's just supposed to keep with the information so that we are able to inform the public. You are able to create awareness in the public. You are able to have some public health initiatives um, in place. Um, it could be here as an individual, maybe with an NGO, maybe with 
working as within the government to ensure that people are informed and we can be able to to move backwards in terms of risk that is brought about by the tobacco use. The tobacco use is a major risk factor. Diseases and it causes debilitating <coughs> and often fatal conditions. And the tobacco use causes cardiovascular diseases and cancers. It also affects the respiratory and reproductive, gastrointestinal, genital, genital urinary, musculoskeletal, and immune So we are seeing that it's affecting a myriad of major parts of the body. You see, if it affects the cardiovascular system, then it's likely to bring about what? Strokes. It's, it's able to bring about other heart diseases that uh, make people get heart attacks, you know, and uh, heart failures and such like. We call them cardiac arrest. So it's likely to bring about diseases related to the heart. Because remember, whatever we inhale or the users inhale usually circulates within the blood. It's also likely to bring about cancers, especially maybe you find that we have this esophageal cancer or cancer of the throat, you know, that region. And basically within the respiratory system, because you're having many organs affected. Like when we talk about the respiratory system, you're talking about lungs, so it can bring about even lung cancer. Uh, we're talking about the, the nostrils, you know. We're talking about the entire respiratory system uh, respiratory system and we also have the reproductive and genital urinary that is from the kidneys uh, to the ureters you know uh, the gastrointestinal system is more about the GIT it's about the digestive system from the mouth which is we call the back cavity the esophagus um, to the stomach the small intestines large intestines, we do have the rectum, then we have the anus. So it's going to affect the entire system. And with this as it affects it, it could contribute to diseases like, such like cancers or any other disease or inflammation within that system. Then we also have musculoskeletal system that is affected. Musculoskeletal is basically the muscles. Muscle is muscles, skeletal is the skeletal system, the bone system. Yeah, so it's it's like to bring about diseases related to the muscles and the skeleton system. Yeah, and also immunity. The immunity have the uh, lymph lymph glands or nodes. You know, generally the immunity of the body is lowered. So it's also responsible for congenital anomalies, uh, low birth weight, and respiratory conditions in children. So we are seeing that with tobacco use. Having said that it's one of the leading causes of death, I think now you understand the whole thing. Because we've seen it affect so many organs of the body by just using it. Then when it comes to the anomalies that start arising from birth, if a mother is taking tobacco or the husband, because by virtue of the husband taking tobacco, in the presence of this, uh, this woman, she's likely to inhale this tobacco. So we're saying that it's likely to bring about congenital anomalies whereby Children could be born maybe with um, with the, the, the spinal cord not having closed up well, or the head uh, we usually have the part that needs to close up, you know, may not close up properly, or some other anomalies like um, a child may be born with three, three fingers or four fingers instead of five, you know, such like those are the ones we're calling anomalies. Then in birth weight, um, Usually, the normal birth weight of uh, children is uh, 2.5 kilograms. So, you may find that a child is born below 2.5 kilograms. So, sometimes tobacco is quite a contributor to death. And we're also talking about the respiratory conditions that affect children. We may start having chest problems and those respiratory challenges within their uh, uh, health. So, half of long term. Users will eventually be killed by tobacco with 50% of these entering their, their productive age years, just losing 25 years of productive life. So we, we are saying here that you will find that if a number of the users, assuming it's 100, we're saying that approximately 50 of them are likely to die out of the use of tobacco. They're, they will eventually be killed by tobacco. Can you imagine 50% of those using? And we're saying that they are likely to die during their productive middle age years. When they're so dependent by their family, maybe they have young family and children who are just maybe 
uh, primary school or uh, have just joined secondary school, then they pass on, you know, so whom do they leave these children to? So that is a myriad of issues. So, yeah. Tobacco use is higher among urban people, and uh, it's the rural is about 9.1%, and among the male it's the highest at about 9.1% and female 4%. So there's a study that was done and, uh, by GYT GS2017, and it was established that usually those who smoke are older than younger respondents or younger people. And among the youth aged between 14 years, 37% are current tobacco users. 7% among the youth is still quite a figure. And you find that highest is among the boys compared to the girls. Remember with uh, the teenagers or the young people, we have a lot of peer pressure. They would want to test like to check out if what happens if someone takes alcohol, they would want to experiment. So I think that most adults will be exposed to the tobacco smoke at the workplace and also effectively. So remember that we have said that uh, there is a time that the government came up with that policy whereby people who smoke should use the smoking zone, especially in towns like in Nairobi town, we have several spots. So, um, remember that those who manufacture cigarettes are supposed to have been uh, mandated by the policies made in Kenya by the legal framework for them to manufacture, sell, and do the labeling of their product. And as much as they do the advertising, it has to be responsible in such a manner that they help the people know the risk of taking these given um, drugs. So in the act that was uh, legislated in 2007, the Tobacco Control Act 2007 in Kenya, you find that the act aims at um, uh, producing the health of the individual from debilitating these illnesses, the disease, disability, and also premature deaths. We don't want people to to, to, to work within their situation. So the act usually aims at helping people get informed on what is uh, right and also making choices of using such, excuse me, that are aware of the consequences. So it also aims to protect the purchaser or consumers of the tobacco products from making a deceptive inducement to use tobacco products and become addicted. We inform them of the risks of using tobacco products and exposing others to the tobacco smoke. So with this, we learn that, um, <laughs> it is interesting that people who smoke, they really want to carry around packets because some of those packets that have the sweeters are uh, of the human body and the lungs that are uh, kind of rotting or uh, the lungs of the sick, sick lungs, you know. That's the respiratory system. It's like that I want to do as much as you check this thing, know that it is risky for your own health. So it's important for people to 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 check note that. But if I'm not smokers who are addicted, they, they rarely want to carry around those packets. They'd rather carry those cigars in their pockets and throw away the packet because they don't want that reminder that this one will be affecting their health negatively. So while there has been considerable like, success in tobacco control in Kenya, this NCD strategy aims, among other things, to advocate the scale and full implementation of the Tobacco Control Act 2007 to consolidate gains and further strengthen its enforcement at both national and county levels. So this is the major thing that we take that so many parts of the body, so many organs of the body, and they're likely to bring to organ failure and and you say that you find that 50% of the users are likely to die out of tobacco, tobacco use, and you're saying they're likely to die during their productive years. Okay, the second modifier. So if we say tobacco use is modifiable, what do we really mean by this? It means that the users can still retreat and stop taking tobacco, or they can minimize the intake. Find that those who are serial smokers, they can take like even two or three packets in a day, or even five packets. As in, one cigar is never enough. They keep taking and taking and taking. So if such people 
uh, are exposed to this smoke day in, day out. Then they're likely to be among those 50% who are likely to die during their productive years. So it means that they can still retreat, they can still move backwards and take one cigar, and not on a daily basis, and eventually maybe seize things to back at the top. So having on the side effects, knowing the risks that come with it, then they can choose to let go. But remember, it's never easy for them, especially for those who are addicted. You'll find they go hiding. They can, you know, probably they've come to the hospital, you've been able to counsel them, you've talked to them about the, the, the dangers that uh, are brought about by this uh, tobacco use. You know, they'll want to change. We call it behavior change, but you see, uh, it depends on the strategy that you use to help this person change on the behavior. And again, it depends on the individual uh, by seeing the use, as in having the, the push to stop taking this or doing this because of the side effects, the traumatal side effects. Uh, so that would mean that they may struggle. They go hiding in the toilets or latrines, they'll go behind the houses, but they go in the boot. Shares, they'll try to fight the thing. So that those who come out of it are that those who, who find it so difficult. But that means it can be modifiable, it, it can be so it's not something like if one was born smoking. It is acquired behavior that can be modified, it can be stopped. What about in a physical activity? Um, you find that physical activity is recognized as an important risk factor for multiple causes of disease and death. And uh, basically, chronic morbidity and disability. So, with physical inactivity, when you talk about chronicity, chronic, chronic means the onset is low. But when you talk about acute diseases or morbidity, it's when the onset is fast. It, it just happens like so quickly. But with chronic, it's something that develops over a long period of time. So, you'll find that physical activity, when we become inactive from childhood, adolescence, puberty, young adulthood or your adults, then old age. Sometimes we may not even reach old age. We'll stop at somewhere in young adulthood because we will in a critical of the chronic diseases that are affecting or disability that will arise and even death. So physical inactivity has been identified as the fourth leading risk factor for global mortality, contributing to about 6% of the, of the deaths. So globally, remember, it's a fourth leading risk factor. So that calls uh, on us to be proactive. Tell people about the importance of doing exercise, to inform our peers, to inform our parents, to inform our other relatives, and also ourselves to practice it. Yeah, you don't preach water when you're taking wine. You have exercise. You know, we are such in an era that people make a lot of comfort. We want a lot of convenience. You know, you can, some people run deliberately less knowing that there's a cab, I'll pick a cab, or I'll have a duty. You know, I'll have a motorbike, I'll pull over. They'll just drop me at that piece at 50 bob. Maybe it's a distance of about 20 minutes walk, 15 minutes walk. Surely. It's a distance that you can really cover and help your body to relax and find the exercise. So with all this convenience that we really want, you find that people are quite physically inactive because you find that once you get to your workplace or your school, you get to school. The next thing you'll be doing is to be seated. You sit the whole day listening to the lecturer, learning, doing the assignments. There's no much physical activity, maybe except for taking the stairs. But again, most of us don't want to take the stairs. We want the comfort of the lift so that uh, we don't strain our bodies. So you see, the cycle goes on and on. So it's very important that... Uh, will be physically active because it's required of exercise at least 150 minutes per week, 50 minutes per week. So even if you're doing your exercises and alternating, like uh, one day in a week, you do exercise every Wednesday, you Friday. You need at least on every day, you do another yoga for this. Always important to ensure that we exercise and this helps the heart function better. And then your muscles absorb food better, you know, it enhances um, 
digestion and the absorption of foods, you know, so that there are great benefits. Moreover, physical inactivity is estimated to be the main cause of approximately 25% of breast and colon cancers, 27% of diabetes, and approximately 30% of ischemic heart disease burden. So we are seeing here some statistics helping us to see how bad it is to be physically inactive and how bad it can get. Because if you're saying that 21 to 25% uh, cases of breast and colon cancers are brought about by physical inactivity. But it's just for us, like in terms of us being active, taking a walk, you know, taking a walk of just, we we'll call it brisk walking of about 30 minutes, 30 minutes in a day, that is sufficient. Whether you're walking too fast or you're not walking very slowly, just moderate walking. And again, when walking, not a punishment, you know, some of us will be talking a punishment for the people who should be talking to you, we should either be riding, we should be, uh, should be maybe doing a, a motorbike or we should be in a cab or something. So with that strong notion, it makes us eventually get to have this disease. So it's important to exercise so that again, we avert the colon cancers. Remember, when, when we eat food, uh, proper food digestion, absorption, assimilation, usually associated with how we exercise and we make the body be able to absorb the foods better. So even when you exercise, you help the, the colon to, to help move the food down and uh, it's able to get out of the body, the rectum and anus. So we're also saying that it will cause about 27% of diabetes so again, diabetes cases right now, we're having a lot of diabetes cases among us, the young people. So probably it's because of sedentary lifestyle, yeah, whereby most of them are physically inactive. We are all over with our phones, you know, we are either Googling or we are on, or we are on WhatsApp. What do we do on our phones? Yeah, Facebook. We are there on uh, Instagram, you know, we are there on um, Twitter, or is it Twitter? <laughs> yeah. So we are all over on the social media. So there's no time for us to exercise and have some brisk walking, some skip of rope, you know, some jogging around our houses or uh, or in the compound or in the field, you know. We are not doing much. Sit up, some stand up, some something to help your body be active. So we find that rates of inadequate physical activity are estimated to be 10 percent in males and 14 percent in females, according to the World Health, uh, World Health Organization in 2014. With uh, this one showing an even distribution among the rural and urban populations, where the levels of physical activity among rural populations are higher. So you find that it's it's interesting that men are likely to be physically active compared to women. I think some this is a wrong notion among us females. We assume that when you're doing the house chores, like you've moved the house, you've cleaned the compound, you've taken care of the baby, you've cooked, you got treated, you feel like you've been physically active. You feel like you've done much and your body is okay. But that is not sufficient. You need to do something more. You need to, to walk. Uh, at least 30 minutes in a day, you need to at least do some skipping of the rope, you need at least to do some sit-ups, some stand-ups. You need to do something that will make the body relax and the body uh, be able to, to absorb nutrients better. So it's important that we take note of that. So physical activity has tremendous health promoting and disease preventing benefits and defined to a large extent people's health growth and also development. So usually we have barriers to physical activity in Kenya, whereby you have population with poor built environment planning, security, inadequate information, motorized transport, and also social cultural factors. So I know that especially people living in urban places, you may want really to maybe have a morning run or something. Sometimes because of the environmental planning, uh, the, the poor built environmental planning, as in, you are unable to have a place where you can be able to do that comfortably. But we need uh, to find a way, much as we have the barriers, these challenges, we need to find a way to overcome them so that we are healthy. Because you know, when the disease comes to you, 
you will not have an excuse to eat. It's already in your body. And you see, it's a chronic disease. You'll have to live for it. And most of the time, it will bring about death. Yeah, I do hope that you are at par up to that point. Um, yes, yeah, so we are looking at the modifiable factors. So the first one we talked about tobacco use, we've also talked about physical inactivity, and right now we'll talk about unhealthy diet and overweight and obesity. In Kenya, is, uh, Kenya is increasingly faced with diet-related and communicable diseases, especially in the urban areas, and this results from the consumption of foods that are high in calories, sugars, trans. Uh, saturated fats and salt, but low in fruits and vegetables. Yeah, we call them HFSs, high fat, sugar, salt diets. So you'll find that if you look around you, uh, the area that you stay in, what foods are so common around you? You'll find this chapati. What else? We have mandazis. Uh -huh. Those are uh, foods that are high in fat because of how they're being cooked. Uh -huh. What else do we have? We have the, the chips. We have um, Bajia, we have the azikarai, I don't know how you call them in English, or are they still bajia, I'm not sure. Uh, we have what else, the sausages, the smokies. Uh, so imagine you getting chips mwitu at 20. You've bought chips, assuming you're hungry, yes, they, it's justifiable. You bought chips mwitu at 20, and maybe you've made a habit of buying that chips from that given, those chips from that given vendor. Every time you're going home, you purchase from this person. So as you buy these chips at 20 bob, remember of the high fat, high salt, because we'll have to add some salt on this food. And being a carbohydrate that is simple carbohydrate, it also adds onto the, um, onto the effect. So as you eat this, it predisposes to cancer, to diabetes. So as it predisposes you to these conditions, amongst others, you're likely also to become overweight and obese over time, assuming you're not exercising or something. So eventually, it, it will cost you a lot of money to treat this condition as compared to the 20 bob that are used for buying the chips. So it is that serious. So on consumption of unhealthy diets and changing lifestyles has resulted in increasing, increased levels of cardiovascular diseases. And uh, here we have like cancers and diabetes, which are closely related to obesity and represent a significant development challenge. So being overweight and obese increases the risk of premature death and disabilities from NCDs that reduce the quality of life. So you find that usually in Kenya, we have increasing rates of overweight and obesity. I think we are doing more of the junk, these HFSA diets, rather than doing a lot of food and fruits and vegetables. So currently, there is a high increase of such intake amongst our population. And we have some barriers that uh, are upon our consumption of unhealthy diets in Kenya, which will include lack of awareness of healthy food choices, poverty, social cultural factors, urbanization, and also globalization. We want to go global. We want to do things that other people are doing. We want to do things as, you know, every other day. We want to do, you know, chips. We want to go for those food that are already prepared in the supermarkets and other malls. You know, actually, about 10 years ago, we didn't have such fast food places. We had, but very minimal and mostly could find like chips and chicken or something. But as we're having supermarkets, you know, and many other places, it is having food ready to be carried home. So you find a, a whole lady going to a supermarket getting food for the entire family from this place instead of going home and cooking. You see food that is cooked at home is usually healthy and usually nutritious because you're able to weigh the quantities, you're able to know what you're using, you know, in terms of spices and even you're able to measure the amount of fat and basically like use the, the salad, that is the oils rather than the fats. Yeah, so the fourth modifiable risk factor that I focus on is harmful use of alcohol. So we'll find that in more than two years, the role of alcohol in uncommunicable diseases like the development of heart disease, liver cirrhosis, and cancer is increasing across the world, and also Kenya is no exception. So people are quite <laughs> into the use of alcohol. Remember, like during this COVID season, uh, We've seen most of these people who are maybe addicted or key alcohol users 
always try to probe to the government, trying to plead with this that they should at least open the pubs, you know, so that they can be able to have some time, uh, hang out and have drinks. But remember, like one gram of one gram of alcohol usually carries seven kilocalories. So assuming someone takes this this alcohol that is of 750 ml, I hear it is commonly called mzinga. You, you do a mzinga of 750 ml. So 750 for every one ml is uh, seven kilocalories. So how many kilocalories does one take? Maybe at a drink after taking 750 ml, because some of them take that one and even add more. So assuming you've taken an average of 750 ml mzinga, 750 times seven, how much is that? And remember on average in a day, you only need 2,200 kilocalories of food, most of us adults, you know, except for those who are doing manual jobs like the Django, you know, construction jobs, the road construction or buildings and, uh, and such like. So we find that about 2% of adults, Kenyans, that 15 years old and above have ever consumed alcohol with lifetime abstention much higher among males, that is 77.7% and males, 0.8%. So currently, 18.7% of the population are alcohol drinkers, which uh, are a slight reduction since 2007 and has been commonly observed in African countries. Drinkers consume large amounts of alcohol. So most people have said you find someone taking one mzinga 750 ml you know most people who drink you know, that's form of addiction they need to take large amounts and as this fills up the system they're unable to take food healthier food and most of them end up getting either malnourished or with these diseases that end up being unwished in their lives thereafter so kenya is particularly experiencing the negative impact of traditional beverages like Chang'a due to ad adulteration of these beverages with poison substances and methanol poisonings. So cases of death after consumption of these drinks are common and are widely reported. There's also road traffic accidents, violence and crimes, problems at the workplace and home, injuries, risky sexual behaviors and public disorder have long become the dire consequences of high intake of alcohol in rural and urban Kenya. So factors contributing to the harmful use of alcohol include poverty, ease of access, peer pressure, irresponsible marketing, cultural practices, and globalization. And some of the measures put in place include the legislation for alcohol and establishment of the National Authority for Campaign Against Alcohol, and drug abuse, commonly that we call NACADA. So Kenya has tried through legislation, has tried to come up with measures to help uh, curb the, the, the issues to do with alcoholism. But sometimes, of course, it finds it's hard to work through that. And it's, it's tricky for them to work on the same. So I think for today's lesson, we'll stop at that so that you can we can be able to focus on the non-modifiable factors uh, at a later point. It's okay, we, we can finish up because the doubt has made. So when you talk about some other modifiable factors, uh, like the four main shared factors like pollution, environmental degradation, climate change, and psychological stress, including chronic stress related to work, unemployment, and this may contribute to morbidity and mortality from cancer, cardiovascular diseases, and chronic respiratory diseases. For example, people who stay along the roads, you know, as you keep inhaling that waste from the vehicles, you're likely to predispose yourself to cancers related to the respiratory system. So in Kenya, exposure to environmental and occupational carcinogens such as asbestos, petroleum exhaust gases and ionizing and ultraviolet radiation in the living and working environment increases the risk of cancer. So we find that indiscriminate use of agrochemicals in agriculture and um, the use of toxic products from unregulated chemical industries may cause cancer and other uncommunicable diseases such as the kidney disease. And these exposures have their greatest potential adverse effect early in life and that special attention must be paid to prevent exposure during pregnancy and also childhood. Remember most of the foods that we eat from the market, most of them have been grown locally within our country. 
And you'll find that, that people who use sprays, chemicals to spray so that it, they keep away you know, um, pests and insects, you know, as they use these insecticides eventually, we buy such food and as we consume, we're likely to get affected. So that is what you're saying. That it's uh, an unmodifiable factor in a way because we've already consumed, but it's a modifiable factor in the sense that there can be relations in terms of the use and to avoid the overuse of the same. So, when we come to most non-modifiable factors, we should talk about the genetics. Like, you know, we have no control over your genetic system. We have no control over your, your age. If you're 30, you're 30. If you're 50, you're 50, you have no control. And you see some models are prone to ages as we as they age, to individuals as they age. Yeah. Though, right now, I think most of these sensibilities can affect anyone at any given age. Because initially, like cancer, the abuse are common among people who are over uh, 50 years, 40 years, 45, you know, 60. Right now, we are finding young people at 30, 70, you know, suffering from these cancers. Young children in primary school suffering and dying out of these conditions. So, that is non modifiable. We can't do nothing about it. The age, genetic um, makeup, and because with genetics, it comes with inheritance from, from the relatives. If your father had cancer, then you likely to be a carrier. You, you could be able to be affected in one way or another, or habits. You could be having the genes. It can easily become diabetic so that those that pass on from one person to another. So basically, those ones, um, maybe we can explore more as we shall discuss the same day. So we we'll have the prevention and control measures of the NCDs. How will we prevent and control? Of course, all these will come as a result of looking at especially the defiable factors we passed on. So to lessen the impact of NCDs on individuals and society, a comprehensive approach is needed that requires all sectors, including health, finance, foreign affairs, education, and culture, planning, and others, to act together to reduce the risks associated with NCDs as well as promote the interventions to prevent and control them. So an important way to reduce the NCDs is to focus basically on lessening the risk factors uh, associated with these diseases. And we are talking about the low-cost solutions because we want to find ways in which you can use these factors in a way that is cost-effective, in a way that people can be able to, everyone can be able to meet up with them, whether of high class, middle class, or low class, you know, of low socioeconomic status. So local solutions exist to reduce the common multiple factors, mainly tobacco use and healthy diet and physical inactivity, and also the harmful use of alcohol and the map the and the map the epidemic NCDs of NCDs and their risk factors. So other ways to reduce the NCDs are high impact essential interventions that are likely to be delivered through primary healthcare approach to strengthen early detection and timely treatments. Like you know, like right now we drum support for for, for actually people going to health facilities and having screening in their bodies. We don't have to wait to, to, to have that headache, to have that stomach, to have that back pain, to have that, you know, nausea, to have a vomiting of fever for you to go to hospital. It is said that it's usually advisable to have a medical check at least twice a year. This is that every six months. And with this, you know, yeah, when the doctor is able to do a lot of screening on your body parts, the fluids from your body and the muscle. If there's any anomaly, if there's any disease that could be developing, it can be managed early, especially with the cancers when they're in the first stage, they can easily be treated or managed. And like when they had, they have progressed to the third or fourth stage. So there's that aspect of the primary healthcare, whereby we need to ensure that there is timely early detection and also timely treatment. So evidence shows that interventions are, are excellent economic investments. Because if applied to patients early, they can reduce the need for more expensive treatment. And these measures can be implemented in various risk levels. The greatest part of this can be achieved by creating healthy uh, public policy that promote the NCD interventions and control prevention and control, and also reorienting health systems to address these barriers of people with such diseases. The lower income countries generally have lower capacity for the prevention and control of non-communicable diseases, but the high income countries are nearly four times more likely to have the NCD services covered by health insurance than the low income countries. 
So you find that countries with inadequate health insurance coverage are likely to promote universal access to essential NCD interventions. So we have several aspects that are, are likely to, to, to be like barriers to NCD prevention. Like we don't prioritize basically the NCD prevention as nations or at government level in terms of policy making, uh, the, there's lack of resources available to the public for initiatives on awareness, you know, there's low level of awareness on strategies of prevention, availability of, and affordability of, of quality, safe and efficacious basic technologies, you know, lack of also enabling environment with appropriate regulation and physical measures, it also lack of progressive local, regional, and international partnerships in order to curb all this. So you shall do more of the reading and find out what more can be done. So basically we've looked at the risk factors of the non-communicable diseases. And I do want to hope that by the end of this lesson, you are able now to draw the relationship between smoking and lung cancers, but also able to explain some factors leading to alcoholism and maybe describe the relationship between diet and avoid or obesity. And also how can lack of sensitivity to arthritis and obesity can be able to relate some of these diseases that will come as a result of the risk factor that we talked about. We focus on majorly the modifiable risk factors, which are the most common, but then unmodifiable ones, we've mentioned them, and it, it will be an assignment for, for further reading on the same. So we've been able to look at the modifiable risk factors and we've been able to unpack all of them and explain how we can get affected. So I do hope that if you have any questions, we shall interact in the class and we shall be able to bring the issues out. So I look to see you. Thank you and have a good day.